Hi, this is Jim Ruff, and uh, welcome to the Jim Ruff Show. Today I'm here with uh, a new friend of mine, John Gastel, who's very much interested in some of the same topics that I've been writing and interested in about uh, around democracy and deliberation. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. And I wanted to just be sure I got John's books uh, up on the camera where you can see them. Um, this one is Democracy in Small Groups, and the subtitle is Participation, Decision Making, and Communication. Um, and this is the one you wrote first, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is the second book that is fairly recent, right mm -hmm. away, right? Mm -hmm. And it's by popular demand, Revitalizing Representative Democracy Through Deliberative Elections. There you go. So that's a pretty exciting topic for me, and, and I think I'm hopeful that we'll all benefit from, from hearing about this. Um, John, could you tell us, like, what, what's the, if you had to find one, I mean, what's the message of these books right away? Uh, what, what do you, what do you want us to hear when you're trying to reach out to the audience? I, I would say that the central message is really that citizen deliberation, face-to-face, -face, careful, searching discussion among citizens is really at the heart of a democratic society and a democratic political system and that we don't really have enough of that citizen deliberation in our political process right now and in our social cultural institutions. And we need to better understand what it means to be democratic in a small group and what it means to deliberate. And we need to find new ways of linking citizen deliberation to the larger scale political issues that we address, to the elections that we hold and so on. So it's about getting citizens to be talking in, a, in a, a, a way that's high quality conversations and somehow linking those conversations to the collective process, the official process. Yeah, we have lots of talk. There's no shortage of talk, whether it's a talk show or a public hearing where people just talk at elected representatives or even town halls where a lot of people get together and talk. But the, the quality of the discussion is usually quite poor. Uh, there, there's a lack of deliberation in those kinds of exchanges and what we really need to do is think about how to create public institutions that promote real citizen deliberation. Okay, and what kind of public institutions do you have in mind? Well, in, by popular demand, I, I wind up advocating something very specific. When I wrote Democracy in Small Groups, I was writing in, in general about what it means to be democratic in a group, and a lot of people needled me and said, ah, but, but what could we really do to change the way we, we operate as a society? How could we create a, a meaningful citizen deliberation beyond this sort of democratic ideal that I described in the first book? And so in By Popular Demand, what I argue for is a kind of citizen deliberation that would have a real effect on our elections and consequently on the way our elected representatives behave. So I'll throw you an example. Let's take the Washington State Legislature. When we vote in legislative elections, uh, if you're the typical voter, you don't actually really know that much about the particular candidates up for election. You might know the name of your representative, though actually most of us don't when we vote and you probably know very little about the opponent. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had the opportunity as a citizen to get together with fellow citizens, maybe in a group of, of 50 citizens, and talk through the issues that are relevant in that legislative election for a full week, paid at government expense? Well, obviously we can't all do that and make these wonderfully deliberative, informed decisions, but what if a, a, a microcosm of the state population was brought together for that purpose and you had the opportunity to read in a voter's guide what their analysis of the issues were and their takes on the candidates were? You might find that really informative. You could maybe go to a website and learn even more detail. But then you could go into the voting booth at least knowing what a deliberative judgment of your peers thought even if you yourself didn't have the chance to deliberate. Um, and so in By Popular Demand, what I argue for is the use of these, which I call uh, citizen panels, uh, in all kinds of different elections for, again, that same purpose of giving every citizen sort of a random chance of deliberating in that special way, but then the, the mass public gets the chance to read the ideas and recommendations that come out of that deliberation. Okay, so, <clears throat> so one of the proposals or, that you would support is uh, a random selection of citizens to meet kind of and vicariously have a conversation for 
the collective, all of us. And then they would, what, report back to all of us? That's right. And that reporting back step is really critical. If we just convened a random sample of the state population and had it deliberate, who knows what would happen? Uh, they would reach some kind of a decision, but would anyone really know about it? Well, citizen juries is, are something that have been tried all around the United States. And the public in the state or the county or the nation, they don't really hear about these things when they happen. If there's a citizen jury on hog farming, it's very meaningful to the people who deliberate and to the officials who might come and watch. But for the most part, the residents of that state or that county don't even hear about it. So how is it reported back to the public is critical. And what I argue is that it actually has to be printed in the voting guide, that there has to be some synopsis of the citizen deliberation. And I actually took it a step farther in by popular demand. I would like to remind everyone that this was before uh, we had the butterfly ballot. I actually advocated complicating the ballots we use by adding the information from these citizen panels to people's ballots. In retrospect, that idea uh, probably isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I don't think there's a lot of movement for making ballots more complicated. But at the time, it seemed like a great idea. The, and the reason I took it that far is it's, it's hard to reach the mass public in an election. Uh, we put up all sorts of barriers to information. And we get overloaded. And some people go into the voting booth knowing almost nothing. Um, and putting something on the ballot would give them one more chance to get that information. Uh, but at a minimum, the voting guide is distributed to every registered household. So that actually accomplishes a great deal. OK, and so this is very, we've had Ned Crosby and Pat Ben on the show before, and they have the Washington State Citizens Initiative review process, and this is really similar to what you're describing, I guess. It has a great deal of similarity. Ned and I were, were talking through these same ideas at the time. What I tried to do in By Popular Demand is actually spend most of the book laying out an analysis of our electoral system and really setting up the arguments for something like citizen panels, which I do discuss for a, a full chapter. But to me, it's as interesting why we need them as it is to explore what they might look like. Why do we need them? We need them because you can't expect your elected representative to deliberate if you don't deliberate when you elect them. That is, if I'm an elected representative and I want to be reelected, I have to think what kinds of behaviors are going to win me votes. And deliberation doesn't count for anything. The citizens aren't going to be deliberating when they vote. They're not going to know whether or not you deliberated. They're not really going to know much about the detail of what you did in office. They're going to know some sound bites. They're going to look for symbolic behaviors. And those are the ones you get. If, on the other hand, citizens were deliberating, or at least they were using deliberative judgments when making voting decisions, now suddenly it's important what the details of your behavior as an elected representative were. Your action on, say, a controversial bill will be judged not by some superficial uh, public opinion poll, but by a deliberative body that scrutinizes your behavior and sees whether or not you were just posturing or you really went after the issue and took a, a solid, possibly controversial stance. Don't, don't you think people do that now? Don't you think they, uh, it seems to me that they, that I look and others look at what's happening on TV and look at the way Congress is talking and they flick to Channel 28 and look at C-SPAN uh, and, and see this kind of conversation that's happening. Right. And uh, certainly in my case, I want to slap my head and go, oh my goodness, they'll never come up with anything that way. So but isn't the public already <laughs> deliberating when they vote? Well, are, no, I'm, aren't they already aware of what's a high quality conversation? And can they, can't they already see that it isn't happening? Well, one of the things I like to do in, in general when I talk about social and political phenomena is I like to get away from a, a V and talk about the different subgroups. So we often talk about the public. Doesn't the public already do X? Well, if you look at all kinds of data on what the public knows, their media use, and so on, you can roughly divide it into three groups. There is this public that you're describing that actually will watch C-SPAN for more than five seconds at a time, which is a long time when you're channel surfing. Uh, there, there is that group that is called ideological in the sense that they have an elaborate set of values and beliefs. They can reference the candidates with those and, and make some relatively well-informed judgments. Even those people, though, still know almost nothing about the opponent in a typical election. And there's a second group, sort of the middle third, that are, have much less sure footing 
but they reply on, rely on one thing, which is party cue. That is, I'm a Democrat, you're a Democrat, I'm voting for you. This group does okay in general elections because they have some sense for what it means to be Democrat versus Republican and can vote based on that, but they're completely without mooring in a primary. And in many elections, the primary is the most important election. In a safe Democratic district, if I'm a Democrat, the general election is meaningless. What matters is who we elect in the Democratic primary. They also have an impossible time in nonpartisan races, many of which are important, and on initiatives have nothing to go on but maybe the recommendations of their party. And then there's finally the last third of the public, which still votes, but may be independent and have no partisan basis for making judgments, Democrat, Republican. Uh, they may have a party affiliation, but it's extremely weak. And they just don't know much about politics. They know very little, close to nothing. What they know is just as likely to be false as it is true. And the citizen panels that I argue for would be most valuable to that last third. Because if you ask them about where they get information and so on, what they'll tend to say is, I don't know who to trust. And actually a survey was done on whether or not citizens would be more likely to trust the judgment of a deliberative body of their peers or the US Congress. And actually overwhelmingly, more than two to one, people said, you know, I'd actually trust a deliberative body of my peers. So I think you could reach out to, a, to at least that bottom third of the public who isn't blinded by partisanship and will admit that they're very uninformed. And would that make a difference? I don't think I need to try to convince anyone that maybe one to 10% change in vote percentage could cause a different outcome in an election. I think we're pretty familiar with the concept of a close election at this point in history. Yeah. So yeah, the citizen panels could have a real impact if they even just make a portion of the public vote in a more deliberative way. I think a lot, I guess I, my own thinking is storming in here and wanting to Excellent. influence things, but a lot of what you're saying says that is really assuming that our system is working and that somehow if we can fix the elective process, then everything's going to be better. And I guess my, my personal sense is that's not enough. That ain't going to do it. It's not so much that I believe that the system works. It's that I believe that the system exists. And having worked in political campaigns, having followed politics, I, I get a very real sense that the things that our elected representatives do absolutely matter. They have a tremendous impact on our lives, and I think we have a responsibility to try to influence their behavior. Now, we can try to do that directly by writing to our representative and so on, but in, by popular demand, I'm arguing, no, let's actually fiddle with the system that gets them elected. Let's just create this new institution of these citizen panels and see what that does to the behavior of our elected representatives and to the way in which we make voting choices. Does that mean I think the system works? No, actually. I think the system has to have this institutional change. Do I think that that institutional change will create a substantially better life for myself and all the people in our nation? I absolutely do. So the system is broken, and I'm not saying that this fixes it in sort of a utopian sense, but I am saying I think it could make it better, and it certainly is worth trying. Make it better and worth trying, yeah. Because it's like, let me give you, you know, let's just play and assume that you, you get, everything works perfectly. And not only do you influence people to uh, the elected representatives to be much more thoughtful and more deliberative and whatever. Um, so, okay, there they are. That, that so it's, it's actually working you. It's working perfectly. Is this a dream sequence? A dream sequence. <laughs> so, I mean, where are we then? Do we have, do we have, I think, I think you're right that we've got an improvement, but are we still destroying the planet? Are we still in a crazy distribution of wealth? Or are we still, uh, what, what, I, what I'm proposing doesn't have a direct impact on the substantive choices that our elected representatives make. It has an indirect impact. That is, if this works, as we say, we're in the dream sequence and the, the screen went like this and everything is working the way I, I argue it could, well now suddenly we've got deliberation as a norm both for how citizens think and vote and how our elected representatives behave in their legislative bodies. Now, if they start deliberating, I think you're going to get much better public policy. Things that look good as symbolic politics don't look good when you're in a room deliberating on a policy for weeks on end. They look stupid. <coughs> um, so yeah, I think we could get real substantive change as a result, but it is an indirect result. And in that sense, I, I like to say that the citizen panels are, are ideologically neutral. 
What they're, the only thing they're not neutral about is that we need deliberation and we need more of it and we, we need it both among citizens and in our institutions. But it is neutral with regard to the policy outcome. I have my theories about what policies might come about if we deliberated. Somebody else has their theories. And one of the beauties of, of proposals like this is everybody tends to think that if we only deliberated, my views would be vindicated. Uh, well, the truth is that probably, hopefully, we'd arrive at some view that maybe neither party really had in mind when they supported the idea. And that we'd arrive at some, maybe some new vision, some new idea. Along the lines of the, the wisdom counsels that you've advocated, sometimes you discover something new that wasn't the sort of either or alternatives you came in with. Uh, but even if we wound up either or, I think we would get some distribution of different ideas prevailing in a more deliberative context. Yeah, I, I think we're we're simpatico in that, actually. Muy simpatico. What I'm hearing you say, and, and I would, you know, I'm really with you on this, I think, too. Uh, as an interviewer, I don't like to be imposing my own views, but you and I talked about this earlier and said it was fine. <laughs> but uh, but, but uh, it seems like um, what we're talking about is, is if we could get this higher quality of conversation to be central in our system mm -hmm. among people and among representatives, then we sort of have opened the doors to p new possibilities. To, uh, well, to me, uh, for, certainly in my case, to being heard, I mean, because I think I have a, an answer of sorts, uh, to be able to be heard differently, but, but to share, um, to really spark a different kind of thinking. Right. Well, we, we do have a powerful historical moment in our American mythology, which is the Constitutional Convention. And we think of the founders of, as being imperfect people with all sorts of biases and so on and agendas, which they all certainly had and we have today. But they really did come up with something novel. They really did come up with a political system, whatever its faults were, and it certainly had them, that was creative. And when you read the, the accounts of that experience from various people who were actually there, time and again they say, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see us arriving at that end point. I thought we'd argue over this, and we did, and then we argued over that. But there were some real innovations in, in, American, uh, in American political life that, that we now take for granted, created at a deliberative convention. And of course there was negotiating and jockeying and so on, but there really was some degree of deliberation. And now it's kind of a forgotten American tradition. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that, uh, that your point is so well taken. How did, how did this country come into being? It came into being from this quality of conversation, this deliberative quality of conversation that you and I are aspiring to help society get back to in a way. So, so we know that, that if, if people can get to that place, new things happen. And you're pointing to this example of the, the founders in, of our country doing that, that they actually had a deliberative moment. And, uh, and you and I, I guess, see that this possibility exists today also. Right. There's, there's a wonderful book called The Voice of the People, written by Jim Fishkin, which talks about actually different points in history where we, we have these deliberative uh, experiences as a nation. Um, and again, lots of people are talking about this. Deliberation as a word has become somewhat hip and trendy in certain academic circles be because it, it seems to have some, some usefulness, some, some meaning right now. It may not, you know, trends uh, tend to become unhip at some point, but hopefully this idea will lodge itself in the public consciousness that, you know, we've reached the point where, where now we really have to expect ourselves to deliberate. It's not just enough to use majority rule to settle disputes. We need to think about doing more than settling disputes and really arriving at creative solutions to complex technological, moral problems that face us. Right. It's not about, well, I, my words are, it's not a transactional conversation. It's a transformational conversation that we need to have. Um, and, and I'm not advocating that we do away with the institutions that get us through the hard times. Right. That is, you do need to take a majority vote very often you, when you don't reach consensus. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have a deliberative conversation about an issue just because we expect at the end of the day we still may not agree. Yeah. Uh, those aren't mutually exclusive. And I think sometimes people 
superficially say, oh, well, that's not going to work. We have to have majority rule because not everyone is going to agree. We've got millions of people. Well, that's true. But does that really mean we can't deliberate in the course of making our decisions, whether it's voting in an election or whether it's deliberating in a legislative body on a policy? Let's, let's look at this word deliberation. What is this, let's, or this quality? It seems to me the word deliberation isn't a good enough word. I mean, I think we're both talking about a quality of talking and a quality of thinking. Uh, and okay, for now, the word deliberation has been assigned to that. But what, what would you say about that, that quality of thinking and talking that when, when we say the word deliberation? What are the characteristics of deliberation? Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, one way you can think of it, one facet of deliberation is problem analysis. Uh, how well can you define the problem? What is it that we're talking about? What is this problem? Whether it's uh, an environmental problem, uh, a social problem, abortion, education, what have you. Let's define the problem clearly. Then how strong is our information base? How much do we really know about this problem? Next, what are a range of solutions? Have we really considered a wide range of possible ways of addressing this problem? Then what are our criteria? You know, that's really prior to even coming up with solutions. What are the criteria we're going to ultimately be using? What are the things that need to be accomplished by a good solution? Then the application of those to the solutions, obviously, and the choice of one. That's kind of a, a rational problem-solving aspect to it. Uh, there's another facet to it, which is sort of a, a democratic component. If we're really being deliberative, I think there need to be equal and adequate opportunities for the different participants to, to speak and take part. On the other hand, we also need to have careful consideration of what each other is saying. And we need to be able to comprehend each other. Not, not, you, know, you can't consider what the other person says if you don't quite understand you know, what the treasurer's report was all about. It's just too technical. Um, and then finally, there's kind of a, a warm, fuzzy, squishy component, which I'll, I'll just call dialogue for now, which, which really gets beyond the problem analysis and the democratic procedures and starts to say, well, what if we have different languages? What if we have different ways of reasoning? How do we address those? How do we try to cross those kinds of, of divides that are really almost more philosophical and linguistic? And the dialogue would be part of deliberation to the extent that we needed to bridge those kinds of gaps so that we could really understand each other um, and maybe try to find a way of reasoning together. So maybe it's possible that people have never experienced deliberation. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the studies I did in graduate school was on uh, adult literacy programs, where the purpose of the classes was ostensibly to just teach people how to read and write, but the teachers decided that they should use a deliberative forum as part of the class to teach civic literacy. And after participating in those forums, people would very often say, oh my gosh, I've never had a conversation. No one's ever asked me my opinion on an issue, let alone have a, have a mature discussion about it. You know? And that's not such an uncommon thing for, for people to really say after participating in a genuinely deliberative event is that was something really special. I want more of that. I want to do that again. Right. It's time consuming. I can't do it very often, but I would like to know that that's a possibility. So how come we don't, how come that isn't uh, part of all our lives? It seems like that's obviously if we were to make joint decisions, um, that would be the way we would say we'd like to make them. So how come we aren't doing this? Well, for, for a lot of people, there is deliberation in other parts of their lives. Um, some people have a tradition of really talking through problems with people. Maybe they're in a tough relationship. What do they do? They talk to their friends. They put everything out on the table. They consider the alternatives. Uh, you know, you should really be dating him. Uh, they, they really do deliberate. And you, it's and they, assumed women. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that. But the point is that, that we really do deliberate sometimes about very important matters. But in the public sphere, we have a different tradition. We have an adversarial tradition in the United States of debate, of clash, of opposing arguments, and of those arguments being conducted by people other than ourselves. Our modern conception of the U.S. citizen is relatively passive, particularly when it comes to elections. And so that's the tradition we have, and that's the expectation we have. Even when we hold a public hearing, which is, you know, to some extent sort of the, the logical institutional location for deliberation, what is a public hearing? It's people coming, standing in line, and basically yelling at their elected officials. Some people patting them on the back saying, great job, I appreciated the landfill. But a lot of people <laughs> screaming. And 
That's what we do. That's our tradition. That's not deliberation. Yeah, that's not deliberation. Yeah. Traditions are powerful things. And if we want to change our political traditions, we first have to conceive of an alternative, and then we have to start experimenting with it. I don't know that the citizen panels I propose and by popular demand are necessarily going to be the best way to go, but I think we should give them a try. Yeah. Well, it seems possible, I mean, it seems likely that a citizen panel would have a deliberative process because you're going to have a facilitator and Absolutely. so forth. <clears throat> but it also seems to me that our system structures deliberation out of the process. In other words, it's not something that, I mean, this, anytime you have a majority rule kind of process, for one, just as an example, it seems to me you've sort of structured an argument by just because you set that up. Is that right? Not necessarily. No? Um, one way of thinking of the citizen panels in relation to elections is elected officials will behave in, in whatever way you, you give them incentives to behave. If, if I'm a campaign manager and my candidate says, how much time should I spend deliberating on the issues? I would say, are we talking about getting reelected? None. You know, let's go conduct a public opinion poll. Let's you know, clip some news stories. Let's see what's going on out there in the public's mind and let's just give them what they want. If on the other hand, my candidate comes to me in their citizen panels and they say, how much time should I spend deliberating? I would say, a lot of time. Do you realize if you vote in a way that looks absolutely stupid after citizens deliberate for just a week, you're going to look like an idiot. You know? You've got to try to figure out what the best policy solution is and, and vote for it and advocate it. Spend energy working toward it. That, if you want to win the election, that's what you have to do. That changes the whole calculus of our political system. If campaign managers start spending money on conducting deliberative polls so they can try to guess what a deliberative public would want, that wouldn't be such a bad thing. <laughs> so again, if you create the incentives for a different kind of political system, mm -hmm. uh, the system will respond to those. The individuals who are making rational calculations about re-election will see the logic and change their behavior or simply get voted out of office. That's great. That's, That's the great. idea anyway. That's great. So um, how, how do you help your students learn about this? How do, do you... How they, they create and participate in deliberative forums. So in class, for instance, uh, this, this last quarter, we had a deliberative forum on America's role in the world. And they talked about different views of, of what role America should play uh, in the Middle East in particular, but in the world more generally. Are we supposed to be a superpower? Should we work with other countries through the United Nations? Should we form alliances with specific groups of nations? Should we be promoting democracy? Should we be protecting national security? Those kinds of questions they work through as a class, as a deliberative body themselves. And again, have a wonderful experience with it and uh, surprise themselves at what really they're capable of doing together. That's great. It's wonderful. That's great. Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm, we've reached the end of the time period. But uh, I, I can go on about this forever, and I'm going to bend your ear a little bit, too, because I think you're reading my books, and I'm reading your books. So, <laughs> so uh, but um, I've been, we've been talking with John Gastel, and his new book is By Popular Demand. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you, John, for, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's really been good fun. Real pleasure. Okay. <laughs>